an ENT consultant from Cromwell, going to talk about dental care and nosebleeds and the ENT stuff for children. So Thank Kirsten, you. floor is yours. Thanks. Thanks. And hopefully not dental care creating nosebleeds anyway. <laughs> 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 Um, I, uh, I have some slides to share, but uh, thanks everybody for inviting us. Thanks Beatrice for thinking of the idea of dental and ENT together because we do quite a lot of work together, don't we John, where we piggyback yes. on each other's um, Indeed. lists. Indeed. And I, Indeed. I think we've realised now with COVID that we have even more in common than we thought we did. So, <laughs> um, so uh, I'll share these. These, I have just a few short slides and a few tips and I'm really happy to answer questions at the end. So um, it's a nice small group, so that's great. So I'll just share my slides here. Uh, now, can everyone see that okay? Yes, yeah. Yes. yeah. I'll, I'll apologize in advance if we get interrupted. I'm, 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 I'm in a mob I have a mobile home and I'm in the, the kind of um, den place. So children are maybe coming in and out, but anyway. That's life. Um, so uh, I suppose I just decided I'd start off with just some of the regular preventive tips that we, we give to all of our patients or that we hope we give to all of our patients and it's never any harm to have a little bit of a reminder because now in these new COVID circumstances, preventing dental disease is even more important than it ever was. You know, So if we can try and avoid um, visits to the dentist, that's the, the best way. Um, we're doing lots of work with teledentistry and trying to get it up and running. And um, anyone who, who follows me on Twitter will see that we made a lovely little video showing families how to take photographs of children's teeth. So um, that's a nice, a nice useful um, aid for people who are trying to link in with dentistry by video or by taking photos and sending them. But really the nuts and bolts of it are what families are doing at home. So. These are, are my, my top tips, really. There's nine of them there. Sometimes there's nine, sometimes there's 10. But at the moment, I suppose the most important thing that families know just starting off is that as soon as the teeth come in, that they begin to brush them. And I popped a little note there about fluoride toothpaste because you can chat to your dentist. Um, most, most babies in Ireland, we recommend that they just use water until they're about two. But I think when there's a significant risk from the effects of dental disease, it's worth using a little tiny smear of toothpaste. So pretty much all of our haemophilia patients, we're going to recommend that. So it's not that they're at more risk of getting tooth decay, but the consequences of getting it are greater. So the offset in terms of risk is that we risk fluorosis, which is like a little speckling on the teeth. And you get that if you swallow too much toothpaste. So that's why we suggest just using the tiniest, almost an invisible speck until they're two. And then after that, you can move on through a kind of pea size amount. Um, and we also say the first visit by the first birthday. And really, if I could have all my dreams come true now, when Stephen Donnelly comes to me next week, I'm sure, and asks me what my wish list is going to be for children's dentistry in Ireland. And um, really the best thing would be if mums could have an antenatal visit. That's included in our, in our NHS colleagues' um, dental care packages for pregnant mums that they have a, a visit to the dentist. And that's when you can really start to work out what some of the risks are um, for particular families and, to, uh, and to, 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 to package up what's important for, for that family to know. So moving on through life, um, our next piece of advice is that babies should be fed and put to bed. So what that means is that you don't allow baby to sleep with a bottle in their mouth over, the, over a long duration overnight. So give the baby their bottle, let them, they may fall asleep with the bottle in their mouth, but then the baby is put into the bed without a bottle. So no bottles in the bed um, overnight or at nap time. Going back to fluorides, then we recommend for the, for the dentist to, to apply fluoride varnish at least twice a year. So that's something you can chat to your dentist about. And then as weaning begins, then the, the healthiest drinks for babies are milk and water. And our colleagues in, in nutrition and dietetics and our pediatrician colleagues will agree with us that we don't need any of these fancy formula um, drinks after one. So once they're one, then they can move on to cow's milk. And we don't need any of these follow on milks because they're all very full of sugar. And they're, um, they're a huge amount of advertising um, rather than any particular uh, nutritional need. So weaning then involves moving on to three main meals and two snacks. And, and those five exposures that you have to food in a day should keep children's teeth healthy, provided they're a generally a sensible, healthy 
special foods um, and that if there are going to be treats they should happen straight after a meal um, rather than um, rather than throughout the day um, the 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 last, the last two pieces are things that people often don't know. So I really try and highlight these ones. Most people don't know that dental decay is, is caused by an infection with bacteria. And you get the bacteria from members of your family. And they're usually transmitted sometime between 6 and 12 months. So when baby is very small, they pick up the bacteria generally from their primary caregiver, so that's usually mum, but um, in, 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 any, in any family, the primary caregiver obviously might be different. So the whole family needs to make sure their teeth are healthy to, to protect new babies um, from picking up the wrong kind of bacteria. So we all have bacteria in our mouths and it's trying to get the right ones rather than the wrong ones. And then the last real easy thing to do, and I say it's easy, although habits of a lifetime are hard to break, and I get accused of this one all the time in my house of breaking this rule, after we brush our teeth, we should scrub, scrub, and then spit the toothpaste and don't rinse at all afterwards. So no water, no gargling, not even a sip from the tap. And um, I break this rule all the time. My kids pick me up on it and, and they're very good at it because they've, they've never done anything else. But by doing this, we leave a little film of toothpaste on our teeth and it's a bit like putting your sunblock on. You wouldn't jump straight in the pool um, or into the sea after putting on your sunblock. So you want to leave time for it to sink in. So that's, um, those are my top tips. And if we all were perfect at doing all of these, um, we'd have so, so little else to worry about with teeth. Um, let me see now, can I move on? Here we go. I thought I'd just bring in two newish um, approaches to dental care for children that some people may or may not have heard about. And these were, have been, we've been using them for the last five, five to 10 years, some of them, but five years or so. And it just so happens that these are really suitable and really fantastic in light of COVID because in dentistry, our concern is using all of our sprays because it just aerosolizes all of the saliva. And so it's a risk in terms of infection for everybody. So these techniques actually are non-aerosol generating procedures that we can use to treat tooth decay in children and particularly in primary teeth. So the first one is called the Hall Technique for Stainless Steel Crown Placement. And this is where we put, um, I think hopefully you can see my pointer, we put these little blue elastic bands between the teeth. We create some space. You can see after we've removed the bands, the space is there. And then we're able to just put this lovely little preformed silver crown on over the tooth. And this is the kind of size of cavity that this is appropriate for. So this is a lovely technique and it's really successful, really child friendly, no injections, no drilling, and it can be done in one or two visits. So um, it's really, a, it's revolutionized how we, we treat tooth decay in the awake child. Um, and it means we need very little cooperation really to get a very durable restoration on that, that lovely crown. Um, the second technique is one that's been hanging around for years and particularly in the far east in Japan and, and some parts of South America. Um, it's, it's a type of fluoride called silver diamine fluoride. So silver is really strongly antibacterial and then fluoride is, is, is a very good remineralizing or tooth strengthening agent. So in a combination of the two together, when we paint this liquid on, it's like it's kind of like a nail varnish almost. When we paint on that, it kills the bacteria and arrests the tooth decay. So it stops the decay down in its tracks. So what this reminds me of is it's a bit like if your house was on fire, you'd have to put the fire out. And you know, they use those foam um, fire, fire extinguisher things. And, and then you can start to rebuild the house and put up new curtains and new wallpaper and, and, and make everything look nice again. So step one though has to be to call in the fire brigade and put the fire out. So this is what the silver diamine fluoride does. It stops the fire in its tracks, stops the decay in its tracks. And the downside of it though, is it makes the cavity go quite black. You can see this here. Um, the, on, the, on, on the positive side, we can clean that out and we can fill it up at a later stage with, um, with a tooth colored filling material. Or if it's in a back tooth, we can use one of these lovely crowns. So sometimes a combination of the two, the two procedures works really well. So these we've been using for a while in Crumlin anyway, and we've been trying to encourage our colleagues in the community to use them as much as possible. And, and now with COVID, we're, we're really going to lean on those techniques a little bit more as well in children. But the great thing about them is they're very child friendly. 
and particularly in the context of haemophilia, no bleeding risk at all. Um, and they're, they're you know, uh, super easy to use. So with a little bit of training, I think um, our colleagues in primary care could probably do an awful lot more of this too. So that kind of brings me on then into uh, just to give you an idea of how the service is, is running in Crumlin at the moment in terms of um, haemophilia care. And so we see ourselves as a tertiary care service we sometimes provide a bit of secondary and sometimes even a bit of primary care when needed but we see ourselves as really set up to provide the tertiary care and what we do is we identify children and um, they're referred to us from haematology and we try and make an assessment either in person or maybe if it's a simpler situation by just reviewing the notes and, and guiding and signposting the family towards the right service so we notify the local primary care services and it's usually the HSE but some families want us to uh, refer to like a you know a private dentist of, of some type and um, so we communicate in writing and we make some requests and we advise and we guide the primary care dentists so that they are empowered and that the family are facilitated then to get um, access to appropriate care as close to home as they can um, we do some sporadic review we try and review our severe cases every two years but it's really challenging and it's going to get more so I think in terms of our capacity and numbers for outpatient review and then as some of you may know we do some planned care at CHI if needed for children who who need maybe orthodontic extractions or something like that and then we provide a rescue service for children who present with severe dental disease who need um, over, you know, who have an overwhelming burden of disease and need complex management as well. So all of that's not easy. And um, this was my, my, I had a go at this pathway this morning um, and I discovered that you can paint with sparkly marker uh, on my uh, um, computer. But, um, so this is, this was kind of where I see the, the service in terms of its pathway. So we try and meet people in in, in the clinic in the first instance, and then we identify what their needs are. There's a kind of hierarchy of needs here. And then we filter them in, hopefully mostly into primary care. Sometimes we'll need to do some treatment at CHI. And I put the yield sign here for, um, the yield represents um, the haemophilia treatment center team. And they're who we'll ask if we have some questions about management. And if we need to know what sort of support a child is going to need around an episode of care that's who we'll go to and sometimes we can read their minds but but not always so um so this is this is the this is my very unbeautiful um representation of the the pathway and um, sometime i'll get i'll get an ipad and i'll try and do it even a bit less sparkly um but really the crucial part of this is that someone needs to coordinate that because there's a lot of arrows there pointing in a lot of different directions and um the coordination of it all really is down to our colleague carol mcguire who's our dental care coordinator and haemophilia care is just one aspect of the work we do we also look after children with malignancies with cardiac problems children with autism children with all sorts of syndromes and and other developmental issues so we have a lot of fingers in a lot of pies i suppose is one way to describe it and the input of the MDTs for all these children is really crucial, you know. So we have um, a dental care coordinator, Carol, who maybe maybe even is online now. I'm not sure if she is. I'll get her to to put her hand up in a minute. And her having a very clear role and responsibility and a very systematic approach to the work that she does to line up the care for these patients is critical. So she has really good records. She she pursues us all with documents and emails to make sure everything's all all lined up and ducks are all in a row and then as John knows um, sometimes we need to do some piggyback cases and, and joint joint forces to, to do maybe tonsils and adenoids and teeth at the same time or ear exam and teeth at the same time or sometimes we do investigations for the haemophilia service um, and sometimes we have to tag team with with psychology as well for some of the children who are needle phobic so the goal really for us is to streamline the care for the patient um, and the family of course um, and make the, the simple care happen as close to home as possible and the tricky care that ha has to happen in, in Crumlin as easy as possible for everyone to, to decide, make decisions and to navigate the, 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 the whole process. And then I suppose the final piece of the puzzle is the transition element and um, we're still working on, on this. We just um, modified our transition document recently enough 
Um, and we're looking at, uh, we've been asked to, to include dental anxiety scales in there to help inform the adult service at St. James's, um, which is led by Alison Dougal, who you probably all know. So, um, you know, we're looking at transition and how we can improve that because it, it, is, it is difficult from our perspective. And at the same time as children are being transitioned in terms of haemophilia, they're also transitioning their dental service from community-led service uh, in the HSE to um, a private practice model. Um, whether or not they have a medical card can play into, in, into it as well. And so there's moving from a free service for, in the HSE into a, into a quite costly dental environment sometimes. So we've still got work to do on the transition stage um, and hands up that's not perfect um, or, or far from it at the moment, but we are working on it. Um, so we're, we're, we're looking at, and I know the Haemophilia Council recently asked us for a gap analysis of, of where we're at and what we need. So that's in progress and there will be certainly some work to be done around the, the, a lot of all of these areas, but I think transition um, and, and creating a network, a really strong network with our colleagues in the community um, will, will be of benefit. And we've, we've recently done something like this with um, cleft care, so children who are born with cleft lip and palate. And we've been able to work with the HSE and identify a cleft network lead in each locality. And they'll take a, a responsibility and they'll be accountable for the care that's provided for those children. So that's a good model. And our next model that we might try and bash the HSE primary care services over the head with and is, um, is, is haemophilia. So I think they've had a good response with the cleft. Service, so hopefully they'd take that on board well. I think that's, that's more or less, yeah, that's me. That's all I have to say from, from non-sunny Wexford here. I'm, I have, um, ha, have uh, my coat on still because it's that cold. It's not the sunny southeast at all. Okay, Kirsten, thank you very much. Uh, do you want to take questions now or do you both want to take questions at the end? I, I don't mind at all. Any specific questions for Kirsten at the moment? Yeah, I have a question if that's okay, Brian. Yep, go ahead. Yeah, I, hi Kirsten, and I know we've we've spoken before. Um, hi, Mary Claire, how are you? I just thought, for particularly for the people who might be seeing it on video later, maybe you could say a little bit extra about the implications for orthodontics with hemophilia and what are the kind of things you mentioned the extractions, but is there anything yeah. else the parents need to think about when they're being given that kind of advice? You know, a general dentist maybe who doesn't have experience of hemophilia. Absolutely. Um, I think Beatrice has been very strong about orthodontics for um, young people with haemophilia. Um, her attitude has been to, to provide the best orthodontic care plan and that we will facilitate that. So I think prior to that, there had been um, maybe a feeling that orthodontists should provide some kind of a compromise plan or a plan that didn't involve extractions. But I think really Beatrice has been very strong advocate for young people um, with regard to orthodontics in that way. So orthodontists need to, to um, I suppose families need to plan ahead and orthodontists would say that the best time to start planning is at around nine or 10. Now the HSE services don't, aren't able to ne always necessarily plan at that stage, but people who want to go down the private route can certainly do it at that point. Otherwise the school services are linking in with families um, at sort of fourth and sixth class age to identify treatment needs. And then of course there are some waiting lists and things like that. Um, I think most orthodontics now can be provided fairly atraumatically in terms of the soft tissue. So that uh, unless there's a very severe bleeding disorder, um, like the, the, the type three von Willebrands or the Glansman's thrombosthenias may have difficulties with mucosal bleeding, but um, most, most children can tolerate the, the appliances quite well. The tricky bit can be when it comes to extractions because um, I, I'm not sure if if, the, if the, there's always an appreciation of how long the waiting times are for our service in Crumlin. And um, we would sometimes have to displace a child in pain to be able to provide timely extractions for orthodontic cases, for example. And that's a very difficult, it's a wicked decision to have to make. Um, so we would ask that orthodontists inform us immediately as soon as they have determined the need for extractions that they get onto us as soon as possible. Um, so that we can help to plan that without having to displace children who have, you know, acute pain and infection. Um, recently, with COVID and and even before that, we've Beatrice has been um, very much more liberal, I suppose is the word, in allowing a lot more young people to have their orthodontic extractions carried out at their local dental service with support from um, 
with just tranexamic acid. And that's been fantastic, very, very liberating for everybody. And um, a little bit, uh, bit of a little bit of gentle nervousness from the, the local dentists who may not have been asked to do this before. But we've really found that by encouraging them and, and offering to talk it through with them on the phone and really being as helpful as we can and positive and supportive, that it's, it's going ahead beautifully. Um, and it's much nicer for, for the families to be able to have that done locally. So I think those are the main important issues around orthodontics. Is that, is that helpful for you, Mark? Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Great. Okay. Okay. Just on the, the, uh, the extractions being done by local dentists, are they yeah. in mild or moderate haemophilia or, or some of them being done in people with severe haemophilia? The fact um, I probably, no, I don't think we're doing, uh, Beatrice can answer that a bit better because Beatrice makes those decisions. Um, are you there? Yeah. But um, I, if, she, if she can come on, she might answer that better than I can. But no, generally, Brian, those are mild and moderate. But maybe the next, next stage would be that young people could have their, if they're having prophylactic factor at home, that they could have a top up and, and do that um, with their local dentist. That might be the next, um, the next uh, ground to break there. So far, this is Beatrice here, so far in the mild bleeding disorders where tranexamic acid is usually enough, so they don't need additional factor. Mm -hmm. So it's sort of low von Willebrand factor or sometimes even type 1 von Willebrand disease, but mostly it's low von Willebrand factor um, and borderline factor 7 levels, borderline factor 5, that kind of, that kind of diagnosis. But um, because I think it's... It, there, it, I think putting everybody through the dental department in Crumlin creates a huge bottleneck and then the people who can't go anywhere else, you know, are delayed. So yeah. if it's just a matter of a prescription for tranexamic acid and, you know, what happens is the dentist writes to Kirsten and Kirsten talks to me or else the dentist writes to me and I talk to Kirsten. So it's kind of a joint approach. I don't really know what the dental procedure planned is, but if Kirsten tells me it's not too bad, then we'll go ahead with tranexamic acid. So it's a, it's a, a double pronged approach really isn't it yeah and and sometimes they need a bit of advanced behavior guidance as well so some, we might offer services yeah. with nitrous oxide or, or occasionally general anesthesia so that can obviously be a different oh, kettle fish but, but the, 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 the young person who's cooperative and able to manage orthodontics can generally manage the extraction yeah, really awesome. of that can be quite nice if they can have it done with their local dentist good thanks yeah good question Okay, thank you, Kirsten. So perhaps we'll move on at this stage. Uh, John Russell is going to update us on nosebleeds and ENT issues. John. Very much. So I think Kirsten needs to stop screen sharing. Is that right? And then John starts. Hold on now. Sorry, guys. No just problem. on top there, Trippy. Yeah, my Zoom window is after disappearing on me. I might just log out and log in again, and that will be um, the easiest thing. Is that okay? Okay. It's just, I'm sorry, guys, this is all my fault. No, it's grand. I was probably going to stop it here myself. There we go. I have it now. Oh, did you do it for me? I think so. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Thank you. Yeah, perfect. Can you see my slides? Yeah, yep. indeed. So, thank you very much uh, to the Haemophilic Society and Beatrice Nolan for asking me to speak here today on um, what we term, the medical term is epistaxis, but uh, the common term is nosebleeds and uh, its relationship to haemophilia. Um, uh, Beatrice and I have a, a long-term ongoing relationship with uh, children with haemophilia and bleeding disorders, and uh, we see a lot of kids with uh, nosebleeds uh, week in, week out. And I think the key message is that they're very common um, um, for all children, not just children with bleeding disorders and haemophilia, and they can be very frightening. And, um, you know, uh, I have, uh, my, my son uh, needed uh, loads of cautery over the years and he was, he was quite frightened by it. And uh, we in the specialty get used to it and uh, we don't realize how, how scary it can be for parents. Uh, they often 
go into the bedroom at night and it, it's like a chain massacre, a chainsaw massacre when they go in, blood everywhere. So where is the bleeding coming from? Well, interesting, it's a very, the very front of the nose on the septum, which is called the middle partition of the nose. And it's the reason it's there is because all the blood supply of the nose coming from all the different arteries seem to end there and coalesce there. And so we get a big collection of blood vessels just at the front of the nose in the septum. And this is where all the bleeding generally comes from in children and adolescents. In elderly patients, which we're not dealing with, uh, it's usually from the back of the nose due to atherosclerosis of arteries at the back of the nose. But in children and adolescents, it's always at the front of the nose. And that makes it very easy to manage. What are the causes of nosebleeds in children? Well, uh, everybody, including children, need to breathe through their nose. And their nose is quite small, as you can imagine. And uh, it gets crusted very easily due to drying of air. And the crusts can pull off those little blood vessels. And it's, it's not uncommon for children to bleed at night, particularly. Uh, that's a very common presentation. The other thing is that I know children will tell you they don't pick their nose, but I think some do. And um, also you can get infections uh, within the, the nose, uh, bacterial infections particularly. And there are kids with common colds. Uh, it increases the vascular supply of the septum and minor trauma can cause a nosebleed. And then there's the traumatic nose. And then over on the right, there's the allergy. Um, swelling due to allergic nose, particularly in the pollen seasons. So how do you stop a nosebleed? Well, the first thing to do is not to panic. And because the blood vessels uh, are at the very front of the nose, um, we need to apply pressure at the front of the nose, not up. Um, if I ask 100 medical students where you should apply pressure, 50% will say at the top on the bone, and 50% will say down at the soft part. The correct answer is in the soft part because that's where the blood vessels are and that's where you can compress the blood vessels. It's important that the child, if they're older, can put their head forward and sit up and spit out the blood. In a smaller child, you may have to sit them up yourself and hold them. And you hold the nose for approximately 10, 15 minutes. And the reason you ask them to spit out the blood is because blood is very irritant for the stomach and uh, makes them vomit. So if they spit out the blood, they don't swallow it and they're fine. What you don't do is lie them down flat uh, or put cold ice on their back of their necks um, or um, do all kinds of interesting maneuvers I've heard over the years. Just keep it simple and put pressure and uh, sit up. The reason you sit up and not lie back is that the venous return reduces if you're, if you're head up. What do we do for medical treatment? Well, the principle is that it's the drying and the crusting of, of the nose inside that pulls on these little blood vessels and causes them to leak and bleed. And if you can keep the nose from being dry, and so there's a very simple solution is salt water. And you can buy loads of different types in the pharmacy. Uh, Neomed rinse is just one of them. And the child can learn how to rinse their nose and keep it moist three or four times a day. Moving on, if the nosebleeds are particularly troublesome, we start with uh, medical treatment in the form of naseptin cream, which is a nice cream, which again is antibacterial and uh, can be applied. You just squirt a little bit into the nostril and put a little pressure on the outside and that brings it up on the septum and it prevents crusting and secondary infection, which will promote bleeding. And that's usually um, a treatment for a week. The only concern is that if the child is allergic to peanuts, uh, because naseptin is based on peanut oil, it's very important you ask, are they allergic to peanuts? Because you can't use naseptin. Next step up is nasal cautery. And uh, lots of kids have been told horrific stories about nasal cautery that they use hot pokers and electric needles and all kinds of things. But all we do is we have a simple stick with silver nitrate, about 75% silver nitrate on the end of it. And we can apply that just to the vessel. And on the right, you can see that the vessels have been cauterized and they're completely gone and cauterized. It is very rare that we would have to resort to putting a pack in a child, um, even a hemophiliac who's a bad, a bad hemophiliac or a bad von Willebrands, it's very rare um, over the years. 
and that is great because it's not very nice to have to put one of these packs into the nose. So in conclusion, um, epistaxis is extremely common in all children and adolescents. It's usually from the front of the nose. It's very manageable with conservative treatment. And we spend a lot of our time cauterizing children uh, who have hemophilia and it's very painless and uh, not scary. And they usually come back three or four months later because the blood vessels grow back. I think that's a, all I have to say and I'm happy to take questions. Okay, thank you, John. Questions? Yeah, Brian, I have a question if that's okay for John. Yep. Hi, John. Um, just wondering, anecdotally, we hear, and this is just anecdotal, people don't tend to be that positive about the effectiveness of the cauterization process. I, I don't know if that's just the people that we talk to or to, you know, to what degree is, is it successful? I mean, in, in our experience where we've kind of got a minor problem every so often and have just been kind of put off because people tend to say, Asher, ah, sure, you could try it, but sure, it never really works anyway. And I'm sure that's not your experience. So just interesting to know what the actual facts are about that. Well, I, I think the cautery works, but the problem is that the human body adapts to it and so the vessels will grow back. So I've had a situation where um, I've dealt with um, some of my wife's uh, friends' children and they come back to her and say that that cautery was useless. And the reason it's useless is because the vessels do grow back. So it's very important you tell them, parents, that uh, this is going to last a couple of months, uh, maybe three, four, five, six months and uh, the vessels can grow back and then you may be faced with the same problem again and we may have to do more quarter um, but it is a very simple procedure it takes uh, all of 30 seconds to do and it's not terrifying it's not painful for the child and there's no stress so i, I think it's a very effective method um, you, we certainly don't cauterize both sides because if you cauterize both sides at the same time you get a perforation, which is going to cause more bleeding than um, you're doing more harm than good. So we would elect, if a child is bleeding, a hemophiliac is bleeding from both sides, we always ask the parents, which side is the worst at the moment? And we do that side. And then four weeks later, we'll do the other side. And just can I, just a follow up question. At what point do you think, in turn, is it a frequency issue when you would decide, or a parent would decide to do cauterization? Is it frequency or is it like of the nosebleeds or how long they last or just how much inconvenience there is? Or is there kind of a clinical point at which you decide, yeah, it's worth trying cauterization? Yeah, I, I mean, clearly there's, um, you know, if, you, if you're a hemophiliac and you're having significant bleeds uh, every day, I mean, Beatrice will give me a call and I will deal with that as an emergency. And so we will see that child. We have a kind of a walk-in system where Beatrice, we have clinics three times a week. So Beatrice will give me a call and say, listen, this child is very bad, has a lot of nosebleeds, has dropped the hemoglobin and uh, we're having difficulty managing and that's that's the way we go um if it's just just spotting or it's once in a while we we would use medical therapy in the form of naseptin cream um antibacterial or keeping the nose moist okay, so it's it's thanks. it's very much there are no specific guidelines on how many times or how long it lasts clearly uh, people children with bleeding disorders are much higher priority for us than other kids and there are lots of kids out in the community who survive quite nicely with they might get a run in nosebleeds for a week or three weeks or four weeks but it, then it stops and they don't get any treatment and there's a lot of kids out there who don't get any treatment um, but obviously in the bleeding group we would be more careful and uh, most of my kids that i would do cautery on in crumlin are kids with bleeding disorders Sorry to hog up, but actually just one final mm -hmm. thing that comes to mind. Um, you know, children with hemophilia are encouraged to do swimming. And yes. in sometimes the chlorine in the swimming pool can irritate the nose. Is, is there anything that, that can be done around that by any chance? Yeah, well, <clears throat> there are a few things. One is that if you were getting a lot of irritation, you could use the naseptin cream for a week. Uh, you can use that up to four times a day uh, for a week. I wouldn't recommend it using it every time you swim, but it was particularly if you're having a particularly bad episode with uh, a nose irritation sensitivity. There are things you can get to uh, occlude the nose from when you're swimming to pick, peg the nose, and that's useful. Okay, thank you.
I can I thanks John. Can I just say we tend to refer um people to John whose nosebleeds are just continuing, you know, that they've tried tranexamic acid. They've tried tranexamic acid already as first line, and then the nosebleeds are still continuing despite sort of tranexamic acid cyclocapron. They're dropping their hemoglobin. We're having to give them factor to prevent bleeding. So it it tends not it tends to be sort of at this more severe end of the spectrum usually. You know, children being sent home from school. Um, teachers really don't like the sight of blood in the classroom. If children ever get back into the classroom, it's the nosebleeds that, that the teachers get worried about. Um, so, and it also tends to be children with some acquired bleeding disorders. Uh, there's a disorder called ITP, which is an acquired bleeding disorder. And a load of those children have nosebleeds. So to stop them needing any other form of treatment, if we can get on top of the nosebleeds, then they can you know, be discharged from hospital or whatever. But I was going to ask a question as well, John, if that's okay. Sure. When, we, um, when we see people in the clinic, you know, their children are referred because of nosebleeds and you know, for investigation for bleeding. And the dad or the mom will say, oh, I had nosebleeds when I was nine or 10, and then I grew out of them. Why do people grow out of nosebleeds? Yeah, you, we don't see it because I had the privilege of, I'm, not, I, I'm now a full-time pediatric ENT surgeon, but uh, I was for many years adult and pediatric. <clears throat> and we didn't see this type of bleeding. We don't see this type of bleeding in young adults or um, older age groups. It's usually in that sort of, in the young adults, it's traumatic nosebleeds you get, which can be quite severe and you have to bring them in and pack them. And, and in the older adults, it's atherosclerosis. So it, it, it has to do with the fact that the, the lining of the nose, uh, it's the nose anatomy is very small in children and adolescents and the airflow and crusting is a big problem. And um, they get a lot of crusting and they have a lot more upper respiratory tract infections, which leads to it. So it's, it's, it's a combination of factors, uh, age, um, the size of the nose and the fact that they get more upper respiratory tract infections in that age group, which leads to more crusting and more, and the blood vessels are very superficial. As I showed you in one of the first slides, you have a leash of vessels that are just under the mucosa and any breach in that mucosa can set them off. Thanks, John. Thanks. Uh, can I ask John or Beatrice, uh, do you tend to see this as a bigger problem in people with von Willebrand than with classic hemophilia? Yes, I have a lot of uh, a lot of children that uh, Beatrice would send me with von Willebrands. Yes, yeah, it's more von Willebrands yeah. generally. Yeah, and the other thing we've seen, um, and I don't know if it's reported, is bleeding from the tonsils in von Willebrand disease. We've had a couple yes. of girls, mostly girls actually, yes. recently who've had you know blood in the mouth with no explanation. They've had all sorts of investigations, and they turn out to have von Willebrand disease. So we've had unexplained sort of bleeding from the tonsils. And sometimes the children with von Willebrand disease, when they have tonsillitis, will have quite brisk bleeding from their tonsils, you know. So um, we have a series of three girls now with von Willebrand disease diagnosed after they bled from their tonsils and had blood in their mouth. Yes. You know, that's how they came in. How, how how frequently would you do tonsillectomy now, John? Would that be would that be a rare event? Now would you try and avoid that or? Um, tonsillectomy actually it's changed over the years. Um, maybe 20, 30 years ago it was for recurrent severe tonsillitis, and mm -hmm. the dynamics have completely changed now. We've had a mushrooming and a ballooning of uh, obstructive sleep apnea has become very popular, and so seventy percent of our children who have tonsillectomy now is for sleep apnea, and. Um, the, the tonsillitis has kind of moved to the background. There's only about 30% and they have to be really severe. Uh, the criteria are very clear. You have to have seven bad episodes of tonsillitis in a year or 10 in two years or nine in three years. And when I mean a bad episode, I mean mm, you might have to be hospitalized or you can't eat or you might have to go on a drip. Um, so we're very strict about our criteria of tonsil ectomy, uh, particularly in a kid who has hemophilia. And, and it's a big deal. Any child with a bleeding disorder, as Beatrice will tell you, they have to stay in hospital. It's not a day case procedure or an overnight stay. They can be in hospital for four or five days or more. Okay. But we, t we tend to work on the principle that if you need the surgery, you need the surgery. You know, the way Kirsten was saying, sometimes the orthodontists say, oh, and, you know, because we can't take out any teeth, we're going to do this. Or, um, you know, some surgeons, not 
obviously John, but some surgeons might say, oh, we can't do this because of the haemophilia. Generally, yeah. there's nothing we can't do or we can't ask a surgeon to do because sure. of the haemophilia. Because once somebody has enough factor on board and are, you know, and the factor levels are appropriate and monitored, we can, you know, a child with haemophilia can have any surgery. But there still is this element sometimes, oh, oh no, we can't do that because this child has haemophilia. Well, in fact, we can. And I'm always writing to surgeons saying, yes, we can. We'll just give factor okay. and we look after the factor side of things. You know, so there's nothing we can't do. No, there's nothing, there's nothing Beatrice can't do. You're absolutely right. But you, you raise a good point, Beatrice, that, uh, that uh, I have not, uh, I've done lots of kids' tonsils in haemophiliacs and von Willebrands, and touch wood, I haven't had any bleeders, which is a testament to what you've just said, that if, you, if they're all worked up properly, they shouldn't bleed any more than any other child. You know? Okay, so our human right to have surgery is 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 uh, is being maintained. That's good. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. this is true. This okay. is true. The other the other thing I yeah. should add about yeah. tonsil surgery, because you raised about tonsils, is that there is a newer type of tonsil surgery over the last uh, fifteen years. The old-fashioned way was, to, if you can imagine, the tonsil as an orange. The old-fashioned way was to take out the whole orange. The newer tonsillotomy or intracapsular tonsillectomy, it's called. Um, is like taking the orange but leaving the inner peel on the muscle so there's less pain and less risk of bleeding uh, post-op and usually the bleeding with tonsils is usually at two weeks post-surgery and that has relevance if you're a hemophiliac or uh, von Willebrands if you're going to start bleeding two weeks down the line and if you have an operation now which we do that reduces the risk by five-fold so we will advocate the newer type of operation for children who have bleeding disorders as well. Okay, another question for you, John. Do, do you do a lot of grommets in children with bleeding disorders? And yes, there's, uh, there's, again, the problem is that if, the, the big deal is that you, it's no longer a day case procedure. So you really have to, there are alternative strategies. So you might be persuaded to go down, like the alternative strategy to glue ear uh, or otitis media with fusion, which is why you put in a grommet, is uh, to try a hearing aid. And um, hearing aids are good and it's an alternative recommendation than grommets. And people don't realize that. And that saves the child having to have grommets every six months. So if a child is on the first set of grommets, uh, that's fine. And you've gone through the process of bringing them in an overnight stay and Beatrice looks after them. Um, it's a big deal. Whereas other kids who don't have bleeding disorders can come in as a day case, have the grommets and go home. It's not the same. So in that sort of case, um, you might do one set of grommets, but if they come back and they need a second, you might persuade them, maybe we should go down the hearing aid route trial and not have to go every year with grommets and bring you in. Well, I didn't realize that had to be replaced that often, would they? Yeah, well, they fall out after about six to nine months. So okay. um, uh, two out of three children who have one set of grommets uh, are better and are cured, but one out of one third of that group. So if you take a hundred kids, 33 are going to come back with glue ear, maybe needing a second set of grommets. Okay. And, okay. and so, you know, we, we would be, uh, tonsils is a lot easier to deal with because you know it's a once off operation. Grommets can be a recurring operation and some kids have had eight and nine sets of grommets, I've seen it. Wow, okay. Okay, thank you very much. Do we have any other questions for John or Kirsten? Beatrice, yeah. Yeah, sorry, John. I just wanted to ask about the hearing aid, John. How long would they have to wear that for? So glue ear is, a, is very much a fluctuating disease. And so uh, they are, when, when, you, when, you sub, when you ask them to, to go down the hearing aid route, they're, monof, they're monitored every six months with a hearing aid or hearing test. And so if the hearing test says that they've resolved, um, they don't need the hearing aid anymore. So it's, a, it's very much, um, some kids um, get glue ear and they have it for six months and then they resolve. Some kids have it for a year or two and then they resolve it. But usually it's a disease of childhood up to the age of 12 and then we don't see it after that. Thanks, John. Okay. Thanks. Do we have any other questions for John or for Kirsten? If not, John, Kirsten, thank you both very much. Kirsten, enjoy your... Uh, 
your your nice weather hopefully Enjoy does come in in Wexford. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, you both thank very, you much very much indeed. Thank you. Okay. Thank you.